Hello, everyone, and good evening. My name is Lee Fagan. I am Senior Director of Programming and Engagement at the Riva and David Logan Center for the Arts at the University of Chicago. Tonight's virtual event is the culminating program in a series focusing on themes of Black radical pedagogy, organized in conjunction with the exhibition Carrie May Weems, A Land of Broken Dreams, on view currently at the Logan Center through December 14th as part of a multi-site exhibition for, called Toward Common Cause, Art, Social Change, and the MacArthur Fellows Program at 40. We are thrilled to partner with the Black School to bring you tonight's program celebrating the Black Schoolhouse Manual and to share their work, their influences, and to introduce us to their partners. This project expands on and contributes to the legacy of Black community-built schools and explores how container architecture can serve as a current day blueprint for independent school building in collaboration with architects, designers, and local historians, some of you, whom you'll hear from tonight. We have celebrated this legacy in our two other programs in part of this series, including an exploration of Black radical pedagogy in Chicago, followed by a dialogue about the Black Panther Party's Oakland Community School. These programs have been recorded and can be found on the Logan Center's exhibition website. Tonight's program is co-sponsored by Logan Center Exhibitions and the Center for the Study of Race, Politics, and Culture at the University of Chicago, with additional support provided by the Graham Foundation. Thank you all so much for your support. Before we jump in, I thought I'd give just a little bit of information about the exhibition that inspired the series. The Karen May Weems exhibition, currently up at the Logan Center Gallery, features an array of media and objects, including photography, video, text, and furniture through which Weems reimagines the Black Panther Party's programs for young people in Chicago during the late 1960s and early 1970s. In the main gallery, visitors are invited to browse and sit and explore a classroom setting with desks and chairs, a blackboard, um, view masters, and posters of historic Black leaders. As a whole, this presentation probes notions of education and ideals for political parties, revolutions, and their leaders. We'd like to share a very short video exploring the exhibition to give you a sense of some of the things I described and referencing the Black Panther Party's 10 point program. Thank you again for tuning in tonight. I would like to now introduce Shani and Joseph from the Black School, who will share their work and moderate a conversation with their collaborators. We will have time afterwards for questions. And um, without further ado, I'd like to thank you for your partnership in tonight's program. Take it away, Shani and Joseph.
Thank you. Thank you so much, Lee. Thank you for inviting us to participate um, in this series. Um, it's a true honor, the content of the work, Carrie Maywean's All the Things, um, and for giving us the flexibility of letting us talk about whatever we want to talk about. Um, this is really um, special for us. This is our first time speaking publicly um, with this brilliant architect team. Um, that we have, who I'll introduce in, in detail a little later, um, but we've been meeting privately as a collective for over a year now and, and individually for as, as long as four years. Um, so everybody here tonight is, is really committed and invested in this project and, and has a lot to share. Um, and not just for the sake of talking, um, we want to share it because the, the plan from the very beginning, fundamental to this vision for building um, a, a space for the black school programming is to share the building plans in a manual. So um, this is our first chance to start to, to really share that broadly. Um, we have some slides. Let me do the uh -huh. share. So I'm Shawnee Peters, co-director of the black school. I'm Joseph Kouye, co-director of the black school. So the Black School is an experimental art school teaching students to become radical agents of change. And we do this through uh, three main programs. Uh, the school, which is based on a workshop model, um, the, our annual Black Love Fest, and um, our in-house youth staff design studio called the Black School Design Studio. Mm -hmm. So with this three-pronged approach, we have worked um, with nearly 500 students, led over 100 workshops to date. Um, we have hosted three Black Love Fests, trained and employed 25 design apprentices, actively training five of those um, as we speak. Joe left a little early today um, to participate in this talk. Um, we've worked with over 50 organizations, without our own space. We partner with folks. We take our programming to um, existing spaces, worked with over 50 other professional artists, always trying to work collectively and collaboratively and always trying to pay other artists whenever we can. Um, and with this foundation, we're able to crowdfund $317,000 um, to, to realize this vision of building the Black schoolhouse and community center. Uh, so since that um, crowdfunding, we have moved from New York, where we met and initiated this work, um, to Joseph's hometown, New Orleans, um, where we want to build this thing. Um, and all of these projects, all this work referencing these numbers are developed from project frameworks that center our um, three core principles. Black love, self-determination, and wellness. So whatever we do, we're mindful of those things. Those things are considered and present in some way, shape, or form. OK. So what you're looking at now is the lot we purchased to build the community center on. So in back in October, we closed on 8,000 square feet of land um, and we're currently working with our partners, Xavier University and New Orleans African American Museum to do programming while we're designing and building this community center. So that kind of takes us up to date of where we're at. Um, we want to also share some inspiration, sort of the, the foundation for the work we do. I'm going to talk a bit about the Black Panther Party, why we're here in conjunction with this exhibition. Um, and Joe is going to talk about um, the, the Booker T. Washington Rosenwald Schools. Um, which, so the, the party gives us inspiration for our programming, right? Especially art and, and education, right? Um, the Black Panthers had over 65 social programs. So there's a lot of inspiration to pull from, but these are our, our core pieces. You're looking at an image of one of their first liberation schools, which ran out of a, a home in Oakland um, and served the function of educating members' children, right? Um, live in a, a special reality. They needed a special sort of protection for their education. Um, and so they, they realized that um, out of this home and um, 
once the community saw what they were doing, people wanted to, to also send their kids and they expanded from there. And I'll talk more about that expansion in a bit, but I first wanna speak about these images that you see uh, around the classroom, right? It's this undeniable, um, recognizable style of Black Panther Party Minister of Culture, Emory Douglas, um, who we take so much inspiration from. You see him here with Art in Arm, um, prolific um, graphic designer by training, um, who gives us this model of art making grounded in political thought and art making with the tangible goal of political education not only through public posters, but through the Black Panther Party newspaper, which he headed up. And if anyone's ever seen a copy of this newspaper, you know how dense um, every single issue was. Articles, information, art, um, just packed with information. I have like anxiety just imagining producing one of these things. And they did it constantly, regularly, had them printed, um, you know, had to have those printing costs and equipment donated, just the resourcefulness of this organization is, is remarkable and is, um, is a huge source of inspiration for us. Um, and we're fortunate to, to have had the chance to meet and speak with Emory Douglas and be able to, to call on him and ask him for advice. Um, and he's alive and well and beautiful in spirit and so completely generous with all information. Um, so, so much wanting to share that information and see this work continue. Um, and the same can be said for, we missed one, yeah. The same can be said for Erica Huggins, who um, is sort of a, a lead figure in the party um, in the liberation schools, in the schools. You see her here in the white um, coat. She's standing next to um, Maya Angelou, one of the many visitors to the Oakland Community School. So the Oakland Community School came after um, that, the, the image we saw before, um, resourcefulness, donations. They acquired a former church um, and operated a full elementary school, um, all subjects um, for 10 years with an average um, of 150 students at any given time. Um, and more remarkably did so without ever calling the police, without ever calling Child Protective Services, right? And still solving those problems because the number one thing that they did in the Oakland Community School was love the students. And you don't love students without loving their parents, right? You don't, you don't love students without loving the entire community that they exist in. Um, so the model that they provide is phenomenal. And I can't um, talk about uh, the Oakland Community School um, in the context of this show without um, speaking back to the point Leah made at the introduction, Lee made at the introduction, um, that they uh, contributed to this um, conversation series as well. Anybody that's interested in radical education, anybody that's looking for um, ways, models, examples of what has already been done, that's it, right? Go to that talk. Um, it's Erica Huggins who led the school, um, Angela LeBlanc Ernest, who's a, a filmmaker and researcher who's working on a, a documentary about it and former educators and students of the school is, is completely inspiring. I couldn't recommend it more. Um, some information we pulled from that talk um, are some key mottos and principles of the school. You don't see the word love here. You don't see love here, but that's like, that's the number one thing. You don't, can't listen to anybody talk about the Oakland Community School without hearing that word um, many, many times. So that's number one, um, but also educate to liberate. The world is a child's classroom. Each one teach one. Did you investigate? Um, and teaching children how to think, not what to think. Um, and we take uh, see a lot of overlap between um, our approach to um, to operating the black school from from these principles as well, especially as artists, right? Artists is this active making thing. Um, we get into that in a minute, but the centering of love, black love being one of our key principles, um, educating to liberate. Liberation is the goal. Period. Um, each one teach one. We'd never imagine the black school as a as a youth school as a K through 12 situation. We always imagine the entire black community as our community um, and that and recognize this capacity for us all to be teaching one another all the time and education being a lifelong process. 
um, teaching through investigation, that's experiential learning. That's, that's art making, right? That's having an idea and then realizing it in tangible form. Um, and those same principles apply to the work of community building, right? So we're actively doing that. Um, and teaching how to think, not what to think. We begin all of our workshops with the questions, what do you love about your community and what do you wanna change about your community? So while we might come in knowing today we're going to make screen prints, um, we're going to make um, collages, we're going to make whatever, um, we don't come in telling anybody what the work is gonna be about. They consider those questions for themselves based on their immediate realities and context. And that determines the conceptual basis of the work that we make together. And then as we work longer together, these personal answers shift and expand through the process of long-term sustained collective making and action. And with our own permanent space, um, we can have the longer and longer sustained relationships um, and work. Joe is gonna talk about the Booker T. Washington Rosenwald Schools. Okay, so, um, so the Booker T. Washington Rosenwald Schools with the philanthropy of Julius Rosenwald, who was the then um, president and CEO of Sears Roebuck, uh, Booker T. Washington developed an initiative to build nearly five, over 5,000 schools throughout the Jim Crow, segregated South and beyond. Um, and it turns out that when, so how we learned of this project, we were doing an exhibition at the new museum and uh, Mabel O. Wilson was invited to talk about the exhibition. And much of her talk was dedicated to talk about these Rosenwald schools, which we weren't familiar with before. Um, and, and obviously being influenced by community, black community built schools, the Rosenwald schools um, are like the, the model, you know? Um, so we started doing research on the Rosenwald schools and I just so happened to also be doing research on my family history. And it turns out when I was looking up my uh, grandfather, so he has a school, Kuye Career Center, named after him in Marrero on the West Bank where I was born. And um, that school, before it was Kuye Career Center, was Lincoln High, where he taught, became principal. But before it was Lincoln High, it was a Rosenwald School. It was Rosenwald High. So like there's all this alignment and like this, this path was definitely chosen for us before we even knew, you know? So it, this work that we're doing, we're working to honor our, um, our ancestors, our elders. Um, Shawnee comes from this long line of educators too. Um, so a little bit more about the Rosenwald schools and how they were able to Hold on, I'm having trouble. How they were able to do this work. So one of the ways that they were able to build um, 5,000 plus schools um, post, um, post reconstruction was Tuskegee Institute published the, the designs, the architectural designs in the manual. Um, and they also had all of this text about how to run the school, um, how to actually build the school, list of materials, providers. Um, and this, this manual was distributed by um, the Washington Rosenwald Initiative, but also was distributed by Tuskegee Institute. Um, and uh, all the community really had to do was raise a portion of the funds to build the school. And um, Rosenwald would submit half of those funds to, to um, build it. And it resulted in this proliferation of um, education that was community built, community driven, um, 
for black folks who at the time had no option. There was no public school system. Everything was segregated. So um, like I referenced before, being familiar with that Rosenwald model and seeing its connection to our own family history um, was really um, fundamental from the very beginning and a big motivation for why we want to, to build an, a new construction. There's a lot of reasons for that, um, but that's one of them. Um, and this is a super, super early um, preliminary sketch um, that Joseph and I created with zero architectural knowledge before we knew any of these brilliant uh, folks that we're sharing time with tonight. Um, and just kind of going through um, and introducing um, how we began to imagine this um, four years ago gives you a sense of how we imagine the space actually operating. Again, these, these are not the actual drawings, but we will develop um, drawings that will get printed, whoop, um, that will get printed and shared in a manual. I'm gonna say this quickly so we can move on to the next moment. Um, so um, outside the space, the, the land itself, um, number one, um, we wanna have a community garden um, that, that embodies wellness, self-determination, growing your own food, um, and love, all the things are there. So a free and totally accessible community garden um, within a gallery, which also functions as an event space, um, a, a sort of light, clean workshop space um, and space for, for neighborhood use, right? Community organizers, you wanna teach yoga, you wanna teach martial arts, you wanna do whatever you're doing, you wanna rehearse your culture bearing activities, um, community space. Um, a library meditation room. Um, we have a, a generous donation of books um, waiting for us to bring down. If anybody wants to give us some money to ship those books, uh, they're waiting for us in Harlem um, to populate this library. Um, and then um, looking up to what was originally imagined as a second floor, a wet classroom um, where we really get into the nitty gritty of the art making. Um, a small kitchen, which we definitely recognize needs to be expanded, a residency space to host BIPOC artists from around the world um, with no set expectation of, of making or exhibition, but just asking artists to come and share what they know with the community and otherwise do what they feel. Um, and a media lab maker space, which will house the, um, the design studio, the in-house design firm after school, uh, but through the day can be a totally accessible um, computer lab for, for the neighborhood. So once you hear those things together, taken together, you see how we're envisioning something that's both a schoolhouse, a space to operate our programmed art um, activities, um, but also a, a space that is a resource broadly for the entire community. So, with that, we're gonna to transition to actual architects, <laughs> to actual architectural renderings. Um, and first I'm going to um, read bios for this incredible team that we get to work with. Then they'll kind of go through one by one and share examples of, um, of, their, of their work, um, talk about what draws them to this project. And then we'll get into talking about the collaborative process and our ideas for the manual um, thus far. So. Juan Marie Allen is the founder of Juan Allen Architects and Construction Consultants, um, a design and project management company founded in 2017. Juan is a registered architect and certified construction manager. It is Juan's appreciation for community service that inspired her to establish um, WAACC, a company focused on the rebuilding of New Orleans, utilizing community-based design in historically suppressed neighborhoods. Currently, WAACC is working on an array of projects providing architectural historical preservation, construction management, and quality control consulting services. She also serves as a guest lecturer for the University of New Orleans. Low Tech is an award-winning architectural design studio based in New York, founded in 1993 by Aratola and Giuseppe Lignano, Low Tech has been involved with commercial, institutional, and residential projects globally. In addition, Low Tech has conceived and executed exhibition design and site-specific installations 
for major cultural institutions and museums, including the Museum of Modern Art, in New York, the Whitney Museum of Art, New York, the Walker Arts Center, Minneapolis, and the Guggenheim Museum. Low Tech has achieved high visibility for its sustainable and innovative approach to construction materials and space through the adaptive reuse upcycling of existing industrial objects and systems not originally intended for architecture. And finally, Brian C. Lee Jr. is an architect, educator, writer, and design justice activist. He is the founder and design principal of Colocate Design, a nonprofit multidisciplinary design practice in New Orleans dedicated to expanding community access to design and create spaces of racial, social, and cultural equity. He has led two award-winning youth design programs nationwide and is one of the founding co-organizers of DAP Design as Protest Collective. He was noted as one of the most creative people in business, Fast Company 2018, a USC Annenberg MacArthur Civic Media Fellow, and the youngest design firm to win the Architectural, excuse me, to win the Architectural League's Emerging Voice Award in 2019. This is our STEAM design team, um, and we're really excited to be able to, um, to speak with them with you all now. Um, first up, Juan is going to share some of her work. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Um, <laughs> the um, first slide that I have um, coming up here is actually um, a historic uh, building that's on uh, Broad Street that's very close to, um, uh, I would say, maybe the fairgrounds. If everyone, anyone's ever been to Jazz Fest uh, in New Orleans, uh, this building is located there. Um, it has a long history, was first constructed in 1905 and um, uh, originated as a, uh, uh, a clothing store, then eventually Blacksmith um, had an operation uh, coming out of it. And I want to say maybe in the mid 1940s or so, it became a uh, restaurant and um, Part of this project I got involved uh, and it actually happens to be a, a project uh, that's owned by uh, some relatives uh, but is actually um, after the restaurant has been a, a legal office and uh, it's going to be converted uh, for commercial use. So part of the program this restoration is part of is for NORA, the New Orleans um, we develop an authority and they kind of pick blocks and strips of, of neighborhoods and of areas that aren't as prominent as St. Charles okay. Avenue. And um, the charade that those people were alive until they were arrested. Yes. I did a little bit of reading. Anyway, um, so um, this, uh, this, uh, Can you guys hear me? Sorry, Juan, you can go ahead. I was trying to mute the person that was speaking. <laughs> go ahead. Okay, thank you, no problem, okay. <laughs> so um, uh, part of uh, what Nora is in this neighborhood, uh, it's part of uh, kind of restoring historical character. So uh, without kind of having, um, taking up too much time, um, you know, drawings are kind of prepared to really restore the facades, focusing on the, restoring the exterior of buildings that are historic in character uh, physically. And also, uh, usually we always find some historic data about the previous owners and some of its significance. Um, so this is the, the first slide of here, and this drawing just kind of depicts uh, trying to restore some of the uh, intricate artwork uh, of the building. It is a single shotgun with a camelback two-story um, in, in the rear. And we can um, go to the second slide, actually shows the, the front, the, the side elevation. Um, and in part of the restoration, uh, always as time changes, building codes changes and safety code changes. Uh, so part of it was actually trying to put in a, a code accessible stair 
an ADA ramp. So this is kind of what this uh, drawing here depicts. Um, the original stair was, was much shorter, not very safe, didn't have any landings. Um, so this is part of the, the plan to uh, bring this um, building back up to code, improve its exterior, uh, but also um, restore and um, complement its architectural character. We can go to the next slide. Um, this is a uh, two family residence, uh, also um, not quite the, uh, it's in the mid city uh, area and it's been designated um, as a historic district. It's very large, uh, one of the areas in Bit City. Uh, this project is really commissioned by an organization called uh, Jane's, uh, Jane's Place, I think Neighborhood Initiative, Sustainable Initiative. And they like to focus on sustainable and affordable housing. Uh, they established after Katrina in 2005. Uh, I reside in my offices are in mid-city. Uh, so it became a natural uh, collaboration for us to, to work together and um, kind of put together a project. This would be the third um, multifamily residence uh, they have um, are planning to build. They've just completed their second one. Uh, they have a building with multiple units, uh, but this kind of got into um, really a, a small radius of a, of a neighborhood for me for projects. Um, and what's really nice about them is they're not building cheap, affordable housing. Uh, you'll still have nice um, spaces, you know, within it with nice finishes. Uh, so it's, I think it's an honor to be able to work with a organization that, um, not only sees a need for affordable housing and has an appreciation for creating sustainable neighborhoods, but also values the people that would be living in it to make sure that it's somewhere that you really wanna live and reside in, which um, originally in some affordable housing has not always been the focus. So not to eat up too much time, um, that's just the brief kind of summary of uh, my projects. Thank you. Thank you so much, Juan. We already got things we want to talk about. Next, we have Ada and Giuseppe from Lotec. Um, okay, here I am. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Super exciting to be here. Uh, mostly very, very uh, exciting to be part of this incredible team and incredible project. Uh, so Shani already read a little bit of an intro uh, to our studio. I'm just going to add that uh, our studio has been very, very focused on the idea of upcycling uh, industrial objects, uh, among them the shipping container. And uh, this for us is an artistic endeavor, but is very much also an environmental response. And when we think about the environment, we think about sustainability, we also think about just the relationship to nature and the outdoor inside and outside and how a building relates to that. But we also think about the environment as people and what it means to make spaces where people are comfortable and, and that are made for people. Um, so um, we can, this is a, a pop open school, is a, a community center that we did in Seoul, Korea, uh, that where the building is lifted and that lifting allows uh, to create a space underneath that is covered and protected and also becomes an amphitheater using the topography of the site. Uh, so people are in the building, but also outside the building and around the building. Uh, and the interior space is only on the lifted level, but then there is again exterior space also above. We can go to the next image where you can see the interior space that is very open and flexible. Uh, it's, a, it's a space for exhibition and community gathering. Uh, and in the next image, I think you can see also uh, a little bit more of that space activated. 
um, Shani and Joseph, you can if you can move to the next um, during one of the events. Uh, it's also very open towards the park uh, that he sits in. Um, the second project, um, if we can go to the next image, is the Whitney Studio. Uh, maybe a thing that I should say before uh, I show this, uh, we're only going to show three projects, but um, two are with shipping containers. And I think one important thing for me to say is that the container is a very generic module that we deploy in very specific ways. And in that, uh, we find a lot of flexibility uh, despite the fact that we use this repeat module. And we think that that is a really interesting model thinking about the black school uh, and also thinking about the manual, of course. So the idea that we can create a setup for the site in New Orleans, but then that we can create a set of instructions through the manual that can be adapted uh, in different conditions, in different formations for the next schools to be built. And, and this is an interesting, just looking at a couple of projects can give the idea of how the expression of a space can be very different. So this was a, a, an art uh, making studio uh, that uh, the Whitney Museum asked us to do, uh, to do art programs for families, for kids, for uh, young people. And is inserted inside what used to be the Whitney Museum uh, in New York. Uh, and the building is a Marcel Breuer building that we uh, really uh, respect and we wanted the, our building to be very um, mute uh, and also pay homage to this building that we really like. So we can go to the next image um, and um, you can see the interior space that is kind of a surprise, is very uh, bright, very uh, flexible, very open. Uh, and literally offers just a background to create work, you know, for the, the people using the museum to create work. And I think there is another image where you can see it in action with uh, some of the kids and families using the space. Uh, this was a temporary building that was inside the museum for just over a year. Uh, and it was very, um, very successful. Um, very well received and created an interesting relationship with the museum of both independence and connection, which was, uh, we think, one of the beautiful things about it. And then lastly, we wanted to show a project that is not about container. This is a space that we did for Van Allen Books, uh, but it is also, uh, it's a public space, was a public space, and is a space that is very resourceful with very little, uh, both in terms of space itself, because we were given a very, sim very small room, but also in terms of material, this uses uh, doors, uh, wood doors that were uh, left over after a building was dismantled. And um, it's over 70 doors that come together to create this amphitheater. And the most exciting thing was the idea of turning this simple room into a space for um, gathering, uh, discussions. And in that, we uh, face the street and really engage the street and the city. You can see in the next images how the space was occupied. And in the next one, uh, even uh, the relationship to the street, which is the most important thing. Oh, well, maybe it's not there. <laughs> it's okay. So we can just leave it there. I just wanted to say, uh, to conclude that... Um, First one. Like, yeah, I guess there is another image, but it's fine, even with this one. Uh, uh, just, just, you know, from city, from this relationship to the sidewalk and the city, which is... Uh, of course, very important when, when one thinks about uh, public and private space. And I know that in the case of the Black School, there is both the building itself of the Black School, but there is also the site 
uh, which is, you know, has a lot of outdoor and there is definitely the desire to create uh, an interaction with the neighborhood. So strategies like this could be very helpful. So it's a good transition to think about operating in uh, New Orleans uh, and uh, uh, and again, uh, the idea of a project that is incredibly collaborative and also a project that could allow this um, uh, open source uh, system where the simplicity of the container uh, can, can act as this module to be repeated and adapted for more configuration and um, you know, to create something that is independent, an independent system of schools. And of course, one that is made with love, which is central to the black school and also very much central to the work that we've been doing. And with this, I pass the word to Brian uh, to see his beautiful work. Thank you, Anna. Thank, Thank you, too. Yeah. Um, What's going on, everybody? Uh, my name is Brian Lee. Again, I, I run a small practice, Co-Locate Design. Our focus is on design justice and really uh, design justice is focused on a couple core beliefs. One is that uh, we have to acknowledge that uh, all power, all, uh, all relationships of land are based in, in uh, relationships of power. Um, it is the landlord versus the landless, oftentimes, and those with uh, the control over land determine the outputs and outcomes of communities often. And so how do we build spaces that challenge that, that, that power? That's one. Uh, the second thing is how we deal in um, kind of values, our, you know, our values are validated through the spaces and places that we design. Uh, and then the last one is care. So how can we be in community with folks um, or how do we care for folks if we're not in community uh, with folks? Um, so this project here that you're looking at is the Claiborne Innovation District. Uh, in 2012, I started uh, with a, a bunch of folks here in New Orleans, a, a program called Project Pipeline, which um, is an extension of a program from the National Organization of Minority Architects. Uh, you're in Chicago, so you might have, have heard of it. Um, the, the, the program was focused on uh, how we think about social, uh, social justice through the built environment. And I worked with a school that was uh, Clark High School, which was adjacent to the Claiborne uh, Highway that cut through uh, the oldest African-American neighborhood in, uh, in the country, let alone New Orleans. And as a part of that, uh, there was an immediate response from communities that uh, specifically said that we wanna reclaim this space uh, to, uh, to engage with a cultural set of conditions that uh, predated a highway and will continue to, to, to exist post, um, post a highway's existence. And so over the course of a few years, we worked with hundreds and hundreds of people across the community to define and design a 19 block uh, marketplace that in its attempt was to, and continues to be to thread back uh, two component parts of a neighborhood that was split by a highway. Uh, this story has been told across many different cities, uh, many different communities um, have seen similar actions. Uh, we are in the process of raising money to, to, to make this a real uh, thing. Uh, but this is just a kind of a sneak peek of, of what it might mean for us to actually engage in, in uh, the kind of dream of, of a space that accommodates the, the stories of Blackness, the stories of, of uh, specifically Norlinian Blackness, um, and, and provides a space for that to thrive. Um, so this is the Claiborne Innovation District. Be on the lookout for it. It's more stuff coming soon. Next. Um, so we have another project called the Storia Project. And again, a few years back, we started a, a process of, again, community building. A lot of, a lot of our work is centered on, uh, again, the, the principles of design justice, which really, again, tell us that uh, we are to challenge the privilege and power structures that use architecture and design as a tool of oppression. Uh, and, and in doing so, envision spaces of racial, social, and cultural justice uh, in the built environment. That means that we are actively seeking to, to, to think about what that looks like uh, in our work. 
this is a project that is called Delta, and it is a reflection and uh, kind of contemplation on what uh, a history of, of uh, misuse and use of waterways throughout the city of New Orleans and, and the ways that waterways have created uh, the current condition in this city, both positives and negatives and the way that our relationship exists uh, in relationship to water. Uh, and to tell those stories, to not just tell the story of the water, but to tell the story of the people in relationship to the water. Um, it is adjacent to a, uh, a park and it is along the Lafitte Greenway uh, here in New Orleans. Um, next. And uh, this is actually complete, which I, we probably should have given you a, a final image, but um, MLK Library in DC, uh, we partnered with a few other organizations to design an exhibit that was centered on, um, centered on the stories around Martin Luther King. Uh, one of the things that we do and what our practice tends to do is uh, to de-lionize individuals and lift collectives. There is no project, there's no work that gets done as an individual in this world. It really doesn't matter who you are. Um, and so acknowledging that the, the kind of complex weave of people that were adjacent to Martin Luther King uh, in DC really were the people who helped shepherd and shape uh, his impact in the city. And he helped shepherd and shape others impact in the city as well. Uh, whether that was Marion Barry or Julius Hobson or uh, you know many other uh, folks uh, across the landscape of, of the city. Um, and so this project is a 5,000 square foot installation uh, that uh, aligns with the Poor People's Campaign, the profiles of the Poor People's Campaign, and extracts that to uh, provide not just the, the imagery and the stories, but the artifacts uh, and research of, of uh, a movement in a moment cut short. So um, this is a, a sneak peek into what we do and, and the, the various types of projects we put into the world. And hopefully that uh, the, this kind of history of, of thinking about Blackness in relationship to space uh, continues to, to be present in the work that we do uh, with Black School. So thank you. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, everybody. Um, so we're going to stop sharing the screen for now, but if anybody wants to go back and look at anything, um, we can do that. Um, and yeah, now we just have time to, to talk together. We have a few questions to throw back to the architects, and we invite you all to ask questions of each other. Um, but wanted to also give a little bit of just context of uh, of. I think it's probably obvious, but um, our process for, for the schoolhouse. So we showed you this illustrator uh, design that me and Joe did four years ago and told you this is not the building because we don't know what the building is yet, right? Um, like there's some ideas, um, but we are in the process now of talking to the neighborhood about that, um, sharing our ideas, our visions our programs, but being agile in what those are um, to respond to that. Um, and I also wanted to, from our perspective, um, reference uh, like the elephant in the room, shipping containers, like why shipping containers? And for us that, we, you see that, you see an image that's kind of clearly four shipping containers stacked up on top of each other that we made. Um, because we had come to this conclusion on our own, um, watching a million YouTube videos on shipping containers. And before we met Ada and Giuseppe, who've been working with them for 20 years, we were, you know, just kind of compelled to figure that out um, for a number of reasons, um, two of which being uh, very specific to New Orleans. Um, one that if you think about shipping containers as a as an option for building a house as a simply an alternative to a, a wood stick build. Um, you have a structure, like never mind what it looks like on the outside, you have an internal structure that is steel, not wood, that does not absorb water, right, in this flood prone city. Um, and the long skinny form fits into the shotgun lots of New Orleans um, very well. And 
is sustainable and cost effective. And because we because we don't have money, <laughs> because we have to raise every dime for this project, and because we want other people to be able to recreate this building, not, I should also point out, not to be the Black school chain, um, but for their own purposes, right? Um, we want to make these plans available for people um, who are interested in creating autonomous community spaces throughout the country and the world, um, especially BIPOC people um, and, um, and, and people that need homes, right? And we want them to be affordable um, and actually a, a, a real tangible option for people to go about building. Um, so it is this new, uh, this new technology in so many ways. Um, so the thing that makes it unaffordable is, is the, the knowledge of how to do it, right? And so if we can make that accessible, um, we think that's a really exciting tool to be able to share. So I hope that gives a little bit of foundation from our thoughts and kind of cues you all into um, how we got in touch with each of these individual architects. And you see all of these different um, expertise um, and styles um, referenced. Um, so with that, Joe's going to ask you all some questions. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to follow that up with a question for the experts on the topic of container architecture. Um, so my first question is for low tech. So let me find it. Okay. <laughs> what is upcycling? Can y'all explain that, that concept that y'all working with? And why do you think containers are a good model for the Black schoolhouse? specifically in New Orleans? So um, maybe I'll speak a little bit since I've been silent so, so far. Um, upcycling for us, but also in general as a concept is the idea of, uh, it's another form of reuse, of recycling if you want, but it's not recycling. Recycling is the idea of taking an object that has been manufactured and bringing it back to its uh, not, uh, to its material form. So, you know, in the case of a shipping container, for instance, would be to melt it all down. Since the container is made out of 100% cork and steel, uh, except for the floor that is uh, plywood, um, you know, a recycling a container would be uh, melting it down to steel, which China does every now and then when they're short on steel to create um, steel beams and stuff like that, but rarely. So the idea of upcycling, you said, is you want to taking an object as is per se, and using uh, the object for what it is and transforming the object into and giving it a new life, a new purpose and a new life. Uh, we always say that for us, uh, we stretch the idea of upcycling beyond the material. We always say that when we are upcycling a container or an object, we're not only upcycling the materials, First of all, we're upcycling all the energy that went into making it, which in a very energy uh, and carbon uh, conscious uh, culture that we're in is a very important thing as well. But we also think that we are upcycling the intelligence, the human intelligence and labor that went, uh, that is behind it. The container for as dumb as it is, for as simple as it is, because it is sort of like, the donkey, the mule of our civilization, it transports stuff. It's, uh, it's, its only purpose is to be very durable, very resistant, impenetrable by water. Um, but, you know, just, just for those things, uh, uh, it has been created by an accumulation of, of engineering and ideas and rules um, and we feel like we recycle, we upcycle that entire effort, that human effort. Why is it good for um, uh, black school? We think that it's good for everything. Upcycling is, we think upcycling is a very important way of looking at where we are in terms of construction. Extracting, we cannot keep extracting, extracting, extracting from the from this earth, and especially we have a duty of we think of reusing materials that have been extracted. 
you know, extracting steel consumes a lot of water, a lot of energy. And uh, now that we have it, we don't want to chuck it. We want to use it. We want to keep using it, using the least amount of energy possible. Recycling means using, again, a lot of more water, a lot of more energy, whereas upcycling is, uh, is a completely different thing. It, specifically for, for, for Black school, we think especially, especially the idea of creating a design now in a collaborative manner among themselves and with the community, coming up with a set of instructions and idea that can be re repurposed and reused and, and adapted by other uh, organizations you know, in the country. Um, within the container is great because it's, you know, it's, a, it's, it's already a part, it's already a large three-dimensional part and when you put them together, it's a much easier way of basically sharing the information of a plan, of a design, because it's, uh, again, it, it's made out of chunks instead of a million discrete parts. So that is my spiel <laughs> about this. Oh, do you want to add anything, Ada? I mean, I think Giuseppe said, said a lot. Uh, I would just add that I, I kind of also said when I spoke, but, um, you know, it's interesting to talk about the container right now because of the, 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 the old crisis of the supply chain and what has been happening in the past uh, year and a half has made it very prominent. It appears on the newspapers all the time. And, uh, you know, the, the, the ship that got stuck in the Suez Canal, they created the uh, all uh, discombobulation, but, you know, it, it made us also really learn how many containers are on the planet right now and uh, how invisible yet so important this object is and and the sheer amount really makes us think that there is a, a, a an importance an urgency to do something with it and you know we we do it also very much with uh, as an artistic endeavor uh, but we really recognize the importance of dealing with this box that is and that has entered our planet so the idea of its simplicity and flexibility, I think is really exciting for the Black School, especially thinking about the manual, you know, um, I think it can open up uh, a lot uh, in terms of thinking about iteration. Thank you all for sharing that. Um, your treaties on upcycling. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's like a, a word I haven't heard before, you know, uh, coming into contact with y'all practice, but it's one that like needs to mm -hmm. proliferate and, and be like more in the public zeitgeist because yeah, it's- Especially in context so, to containers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so next I want to ask, uh, one a question since I'm the, the question man. <laughs> <laughs> so why I want to ask you particularly based on the work you share how has the history in present uh, New Orleans architecture influenced your practice and how do you see this project in relation to the future of New Orleans architecture wow okay um well, I would say um, just uh, being a native New Orleanian and uh, I've always had an appreciation for architecture and that's probably one of the major catalysts um, that influenced me to select architecture as a profession and to yeah, dedicate my education and my professional career to um, design and construction. Um, the, the projects that I, that I, I showed, it kind of marries in, I guess you can say with the black school, um, in regards to, um, just the, uh, community effort, um, you know, both of the projects that I showed, I have, I, 
a connection to either uh, physically uh, within the, the neighborhood, um, but have those connections uh, with the values for those clients. And then on the other project, I just happened to have a, that connection um, with uh, uh, family on a personal level uh, that has a beautiful building uh, that uh, has an opportunity to, to restore it um, and make creative places in the future for people to either come and gather uh, whether or not ultimately what the use of the building, you know, would become, but it has been discussed for it to be like a, um, uh, a book center or have coffee and have some outdoor spaces and the, the rear property of it. So um, to me, kind of architecture in New Orleans is kind of like a gumbo, right? Yes, you have the, the shotgun style. And as you said before, the container home really kind of uh, fits into that of how you can create the openings uh, for the space, but it also has, um, I guess you can say it, a nice scale because it is narrow uh, to be able to adapt it, particularly to the lot that we have that's, you know, um, almost triangular, right? Uh, it gets capped off uh, in the end. And so seeing how we can um, present those buildings, orientate them, but also kind of keep the fabric of the street. Um, one of the important things of, of architecture as you're walking around in New Orleans is there's always a personal scale, you know, of the person on the space. I'm on the sidewalk. There might be a tree canopy or the streetcar is over here, or there's a gate that's right up next against me and I can look and there's a beautiful porch, right? Uh, so someone can sit down and experience what's happening on the street. So this kind of this conversation without even getting into the details, you know, of the architecture, but just kind of having, um, you know, some of the open spaces, like you'll see the full height uh, windows or the transom windows, but, and the shutters that kind of open out, like in the building that I showed on Broad Street and that porch creates that relationship with the street. And if I go back and look at some of the um, projects that Ida and Giuseppe uh, presented, where you've got the stairs and you have the storefront that's opening right up to the street, that's a, a very similar kind of conversation that's being had um, in, a, in a different location. Um, so I think the historic nature and architecture in New Orleans really um, sets a foundation for creating good spaces. And um, that's the, the thing that I, I love about the architecture here and taking those key factors and that scale aspect and how the human person experiences a space and a building. Because usually if you've seen something beautiful, you'll sit and pause. And um, that's not always just in the, the details. It's how you have the conversation. And the exciting thing about the, the Black School is, is that we are going to all be collaborating with different technical expertise uh, um, to create it, right? And have that garden and have the community gathering and use something that um, is not a common building material in New Orleans, but uh, make it appropriate, make it lovable and make it a, a, a beautiful space. Thank you for that. Um, you mentioned the, the human element, the scale in relation, the human scale in relation to architecture and like how architecture, um, specifically New Orleans architecture is designed with the intention of creating community or, or being a catalyst for creating community. Um, so I want to ask the next question for Brian, um, specifically about design justice. Like, what does that mean in the context of your architecture practice here in New Orleans? Um, and why do you think it's an important process to employ in the designing of the Black Schoolhouse? Yeah, certainly. Um, so I think to, to go back to the definition I mentioned a little earlier, um, design justice is really built to challenge privilege and power structures that, again, use architecture as a tool of oppression, 
And by that, I really just mean that that uh, land and its derivatives, whether that is lands, crops, minerals, and also buildings, are used to control our our, our movements in society and, and and how we form and shape our communities. Uh, and so how do we challenge those organizations, those institutions that maintain uh, a foothold on, on a given power structure and dream up new worlds, right? Whether that's imagining what new uh, monuments might look like in the face of racist Jim Crow monuments uh, across the landscape of a city, uh, or if that is reimagining what uh, a space looks like when it is tied back together post a uh, uh, a highway smashing through uh, the neighborhood. It's all ends of the spectrum, but what we're really trying to do is is both uh, think about it through an Afrofuturist lens, a radical revolutionary lens that that says that that uh, our spaces uh, hold our stories and should be honored as such and should be continue to be, be built upon as such. Right. So it's not just simply that. Uh, design justice is calling for us to 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 constantly be in anger but i have a uh, uh, an organizer friend who, who often tells me that we're not organizing just to be mad all the time we're organizing to be happy uh at some point we're organizing to to find a bit of joy uh in this space and so part of that means that we have to be stable part of that means that we have to have spaces that can hold us that can hold our stories that can hold our place so design justice calls on us to do that uh, and i think specifically in in our work in new orleans um, it requires us to be in community even when when that is challenging uh, you know and other people on this call know that that uh you know, we have good relationships, we have great relationships with, with some folks, we have challenging relationships with others, but regardless of, of that challenge, we are still in community with as many people as possible, and we have to be held accountable uh, to, to uh, our community uh, regardless. And so that's part of what Design Justice really calls on us to do, and I think all of our projects seek to hire people and pay people for their time, now, I mean, I think we grew, we've grown and, 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 and learned from past mistakes. Uh, so how do we how do we make sure we pay people for their time? How do we make sure that we talk to as many people as possible in the work? And how is what we produce as an architecture not necessarily just simply reflective of our own uh, intentions as designers, as architects, but uh, reflective of, of community voice um, and, and not just a, a, a interpretation of a community voice, but a, 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 a long term kind of communication that results in an architecture that is is deeply tied uh, to what community has to say. Um, so yeah, that's that's really the, the framework for design justice and its application in, in place. Um. Thank you for that. Appreciate the understand deeper understanding of design justice, particularly in the context of New Orleans. Um, so now I want to uh, shift to the manual, and I want to ask a, a, a question about um, how 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 each of you architects of all of y'all how y'all are like. Um, coming to the manual, how, how your experience in architecture is being, is informing your approach to the manual. So what lessons in open source architecture, I'm calling it open source architecture. Let me know if I'm using the wrong terminology, um, but what lessons in open source architecture have y'all learned being a, pr a practitioner in the field and how can we apply those lessons to the Black Schoolhouse Manual? And that's open for everybody. And if 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 y'all don't have answers to that, just say what y'all do have answers for. <laughs> I mean, I'm thinking about something that is very tangential, but maybe it's interesting. So. Uh, we're working with uh, with a company that does uh, you know some um, container modification, and we have shared with them these drawings. And today I opened their website just because I wanted to 
make sure that I spell their name correctly on this email that I was writing. And I opened their website and it was like a couple of months we hadn't talked. And on their website, there is an image of a project they did where they literally took the design that we did for this house and replicated, right? So, so for a moment, I was like, whoa, <laughs> you know? I mean, it's interesting how something like that hits you. And I think all the creatives in the room can respond to that, right? When you see that something is, it, it's interesting, it's not just being copied, it's literally been made because we have shared with them drawings. So they literally replicated the drawing. But then on second thoughts, this goes back to the idea of the open source, right? Like if you think of it differently, if we think more about the sort of collaborative experience of working with someone, then you can read this as, um, as um, a moment where instead uh, something that you have done uh, successfully that you uh, that that others that others find interesting and that others like can instead be taken and and continued right and replicated. So uh, I do think that there is something really interesting, particularly because the object that we're starting with is already existing, is there. You know, we're just trying to uh, co-opt it and adopt it. So I do think that there is something very interesting in the manual and also as an architect, you know, we produce, we always document our work through drawings. And so in a way we always make books, right? So, but we make books that at the end are more of an instrument to dialogue uh, with the, you know, with the builder or to dialogue with the community or to dialogue with others. But the idea that these, can be even more intentional as something to divulgate, I think is very, very interesting. So that's my two cents. Yeah, I mean, it, what, the, what Ada just mentioned is actually what scares every creative on this planet, the possibility of somebody else. It's not so much the copying, as they say, you know, copy whatever is a, a flattery or whatever, but it's more uh, the fact that you, as an artist, especially if you are a struggling artist or an artist that has, um, you know, uh, uh, really uh, paid its, his or her dues and all of that, it's hard when you see your work being exploited to make money and to get power, or whatever, you know, that's something that really uh, it's very important to protect. Um, but on the other hand, instead, as I was saying, the idea of that being intentional, I mean, the only experience that we've had is basically in designing, prefabricating exactly the design that Ada was saying that this company has, has uh, lifted and applied somewhere else. Um, it's for a product, for a, for a, uh, um, a prefabricated home. So pre-designed, pre-engineered and all of that, which is a way of basically um, creating a, uh, uh, you know, solving a lot of problems, solving a lot of issues, solving a lot of things a priori, so that then somebody, so that they, somebody else can 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 build it uh, without having to repeat the whole thing and using that design. That's what we have experience with, and I think it's actually very gratifying uh, for with this with this product is uh, just at the very beginning. But you you can already tell uh, how uh, there is a, a very interesting thing that happens around the design around an idea that you've developed and that people keep using and some more somehow, because as we know, even, even if nothing can be changed, the way that you interpret something that is already made, the design that is already there, it's, it's great. It's a wonderful thing to watch, right? To see how people, different people use it in different ways. Um, even if the object is absolutely identical, in the end, the way that you use it is, uh, is always very, uh, interesting and it's uh, it's great to see yeah it's just it's just great to see that possibility of sharing uh, that uh, in 
but I am very, this is one of the things that, as you know, attracts me the most of the whole project of Black School from an architectural point of view is the idea of creating a tool that can be replicated and interpreted by different communities around the US. I think it's a fantastic thing. Um, it sounds like y'all gonna have to pre fabricate some cease and desist <laughs> letter to send out the <laughs> uh, So the other architects, what do y'all think um, about this idea of the manual of like um, in th this history of architects sharing work, um, whether intentional or unintentional? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I find, I think about um, music and uh, other styles of specifically Black culture that have uh, frameworks. So when I think about a manual, I think about like frameworks that, that can then be uh, articulated through a common language of place. So even uh, the, the the kind of stories and 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 um, manuals that were built for uh, the Rosenwald schools uh, were applied. There were 53, 5,295 different buildings that were made in total, uh, but they were they they had a, a a soul that was put into them by the the people of a, a of a particular location. And so I think I think often about like the framework the body that's attached to the soul of a particular community. And so that relationship being kind of bound to uh, the pursuit of liberation uh, in this work. And so the manual is a is a is the removal of a barrier uh, that allows us to get one step closer to what liberation might look like through this work. And really when I talk about liberation in this work, you know, moving past justice and into liberation requires us to repair for past injustices through whatever, whatever item or whatever activation we're doing. So that's part of the schooling. Uh, in general, how do we make fair in the present? That's part of the access uh, to a space like this. How do we remove barriers? Uh, that's part of the manual, right? And then what? how do we affirmatively influence future outcomes? And so those future outcomes uh, are the things that, that uh, I think the programs that, that you will put into the world and that you have already put into the world. Uh, and so uh, I think a manual is a part of these other four component pieces and is kind of necessary to make this a successful uh, end run. Right. I, um, I think that what makes the manual unique is that it really is the intent um, to create the spaces, right, um, of, of, of how to um, kind of maybe duplicate the, uh, the community programs and the education and create this relationship uh, with art and education. And, um, you know, before um, architecture and, uh, became a, a licensed profession or, or kind of a sanctioned, right? Um, people would design and, and, and build their homes, right? Without, you know, without an architect, right? If I'm building a, my, my shack or, or home or residence originally, uh, this is kind of where it was. So I think it really does remove a barrier, um, uh, something for a structure that's so simple to give people access to create their own spaces. Um, and I feel like design, even though you can see um, it's, it's when you feel like your design or your input or your work has been taken advantage of unintentionally without your blessing, um, that, that never feels good. Yes, you can be flattered because someone wanted to copy you, but that is not a, a good experience. But I don't kind of look at this in that nature because we are um, intentionally uh, participating to uh, help you guys develop a tool to um, remove a barrier uh, in neighborhoods. And if you've ever tell, tell a story, or even if I introduced myself or talked about a project, it's never exactly the same. So even if we create this manual, um, it's 
not going to be exactly the same and not just because of the aesthetics, but because of the environment. Where is it, how is it gonna be placed on the site? Um, uh, is it, you know, stormy hurricane uh, spot or is it in the desert? Uh, is it in the hills and the mountains somewhere there's gonna be snow? Um, so I think what's true to that is the core and the reason um, for why you guys are creating the manual um, that um, makes it uh, kind of feel good to be a, a part of that, right? Versus me creating a, a house or doing something and a contractor or someone gets it and all of a sudden this house is just being, you know, constructed all over the city. Um, but I've only put it together or designed it with the intent for it to be placed on one side. Um, and that's not kind of how we're, we're looking at this project. Yeah, I think um, the whole idea of a manual is kind of like reimagining architecture, reimagining art, you know, thinking of like, we're creating these products, but not to be one product, but this is a system to be used and engaged with by a lot of different people in a lot of different contexts. And, um, and, and, and we, we think about the Black school in general in that same way. Like we have those same moments when we like, we'll see um, a little square with Black and something else in it, you know, and we're like, mm, that looks familiar. <laughs> but, but if like the, in, if the, of the the work is inspiring people and the mission is also still you know intact with the the forms that we create mm -hmm. i think you we have to like put our ego aside and be like okay it's it's doing what we want Let's it to do real specific thing. <laughs> <laughs> But 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 yeah, yeah. it's doing exactly yeah. what we set out to do. Yeah. We set out to create more spaces for Black radical thought, more spaces for uh, Black radical pedagogy, community and organizing, community, community organizing, education. Black space period. Yeah, and and we come to this taking other people's ideas too. That's right, and I think that for me the manual is. So like the, the Oakland Community School functioned out of an old church, right? And so many community education spaces around the country function that way right now as well. Um, and so that way it's very different what we're doing, but something that I see very similar and us continually pulling this inspiration from the Panthers is creating models, is showing examples of like, well, we can just do it ourselves and this is how you do it, right? That's how the Panthers start with two people in Oakland, California and grow to have chapters all around the country, all around the world, right? Um, and I think that it's also a, a contemporary visioning of that. I think the Panthers give us lessons on decentralization, right? Mm -hmm. So again, it's not about having black schools all over the place. It's about people already doing the work. All We're already doing the work, right? Um, how can we take the work to the next level? How can we create spaces really intentionally for the work? How can we create spaces that aren't like hand-me-downs, we're upcycling, but <laughs> we're upcycling <laughs> with design, right? To create spaces that are truly beautiful. Like I come from an experience of over a decade of working as a teaching artist in New York City, where half the time I'm in a school with no windows, just bricks built to look like a prison. Half the time I'm in a museum built with modern architecture and, you know, 20 foot high windows. And so I see the difference on, on how a student functions in those two different spaces, right? So how do we take the work that's happening all around the country and the world and, and continue this progression of elevating, of, of creating better for ourselves and, and doing it for ourselves because we're not getting it, you know, from the powers that be. Mm -hmm. We're supposed to answer some questions, but Juan, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, just real quick. So while you were saying that, I was thinking about in addition to the manual that we create for how we built it, but part of this, a real big part is the story. Like when I first met you, if we're logging the timeline and the story and the funding and where we are now, that should be a part of your manual too. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, okay. yeah, facts. Facts, facts, facts. And also a fact is it's 729. 
sure. <laughs> so we're not really going to get to the questions, but anybody that I was expecting to log in today and, and see a finished product, apologies. This is really, really the beginning. Um, so there'll be many more times to, to speak about this, I think, and to ask questions. And I think the most tangible reason for beginning to talk about it now is because we really want to build this database of people that will can and will actually put this this thing to use. Um, so if you're out there and um, and that's speaking to you, please write to contact at the Black Dot School because that's what we need in our lives, more emails. Um, <laughs> We will um, collect that information. We're beginning to collect that information. Um, there's just so much possibility um, with this project, and and we're looking forward to doing it collectively with these architects and and everyone. You know, really is is for is for broad access. Um, so we thank folks for coming to join us at this early phase tonight. Thank these amazing architects so much. Um, Y'all don't know how much time and effort has already been put in. Um, Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, same. Yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you, you, Logan Center. Thank you, everyone. Um, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Shani and Joseph, for being here tonight. Please do reach out to them. I know there were a few questions about how people can volunteer, how people can help, how people outside of New Orleans could really understand the site a little bit more and really understand where it is and how it relates to the city. So for all of you who are kind of mm -hmm. curious about that, I encourage you to reach out story. to the Black yep. School to learn a little bit more about what they're doing, about how you can get involved from wherever you are tuning in from. Um, we've recorded this, so if you came late or you, you feel like you missed something, um, please do feel free to watch the recording. We're, we're thrilled to be able to add this to our archive of, of programs that really only begin to touch on the surface of what the community schools did and what they've inspired. And so we're so grateful to come full circle with where, where those programs started and they've influenced you. Um, the Carrie Mae Weems show, if you are in Chicago, is, is up and through um, December 12th. And I'll share some of the questions with them and, and please do feel free to reach out to them. Um, I've also shared some information about Brian's work and low tech's work. And, and so I um, encourage you to follow up with them as well about some of their projects. Um, this has been an honor. Thank you to the Graham Foundation, to the Center for the Study of Race, Politics and Culture um, and to Toward Common Cause. Some of those exhibitions are still up around Chicago. So thank you to everybody who was able to join and for Shani and Joseph for bringing these amazing people together. Thanks. Thanks.